Welcome back to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I am your host, Ben Pakulski. We have an amazing show for you today. Dr. Ted Naiman joins me to talk about protein and energy, two of our favorite things. We all want to be energized, and Dr. Naiman is going to tell you exactly why protein is the most important nutrient, not only for muscle building, but also for body composition and maybe even longevity. Dr. Naiman is a board-certified family physician in the Department of Primary Care in Seattle, Washington. His personal research and medical experience are focused on ultimately the implementation of diet and exercise for health optimization, which obviously is very countercultural culture to what you would normally see in most current family physicians. So that in and of itself is an absolute breath of fresh air to see a doctor thinking outside of the box. So Dr. Naiman focuses on primarily great sources of protein, increasing the amounts of protein. And he describes why maybe a low carb diet may not be the best idea. Maybe a low fat diet may not be the best idea, but he'll give you his suggestion on what the best diet is ultimately for sustainable fat loss and sustainable ways to improve our body composition. You guys are going to love this conversation. Dr. Naiman is wonderful. It's really, really simple concept with really, really vast implications. And it gives you all the most recent research as to why this is something we should all consider following. Also, if you're someone who aspires to be the best version of yourself. Something I did for myself in 2020, the beginning of 2020, was I signed up for a coaching program. It was a 10-month coaching program inspired by one of our guests, Brian Johnson. If you guys remember Brian Johnson, Brian is the owner and creator of a company called, previously called Philosopher's Notes. If you've heard me talk about this before, if you've never checked it out on YouTube, uh, It was one of my greatest resources in my transformation from what we'll call uh, mindless and stressed and allowing life to ultimately throw me where it wanted to go rather than being the creator of my life. I felt like a victim to it. Philosopher's Notes was one of my resources through my transition. And that transition existed from 2007 to about 2000, probably 13, and is still going. Um, and it was a resource for me because it allowed me to to reference books and uh, learn a lot at a really, really accelerated rate. So what Brian does is he, he reads some of the best books on the planet. I believe there's over 600 books now within his community. And he gives you the five big ideas from that book, which are so incredibly valuable. And then you can decide if you want to read a little bit more and and pick up the book or that you've got enough. And this is maybe for you or not for you. And that resource was one of the greatest catalysts for me, ultimately changing as a man and stepping into someone who, you know, I, I would view now as someone who's educated and someone who thinks well and someone ultimately who is not a victim to life. And all of those books that Brian imparted on me were truly a big, big part of that uh, process. So uh, I'm super blessed and super grateful to announce Optimize as one of the show sponsors for the Muslim Intelligence Podcast. You guys can go to optimize.me, optimize.me slash muscle and get a, a membership for free. I know I've paid hundreds of dollars uh, per year to this website in the past because it's just so valuable. There's also so many other things that exist on this website. Head over to optimize.me slash muscle and get hooked up with a membership for free. And also here's the kicker, guys. You can get a this course that I told you about, this coaching program, this 10-month coaching program, which I paid well over a thousand dollars for when I did in 2020. And yes, I paid. I didn't get anything gifted to me. Um, is now on sale right now only for $300 and you can bring a friend for free. I absolutely love what Brian's doing. Brian truly is on a mission to give back to the world and ultimately allow people to uh, thrive. So sorry about my ramble, guys. I really wanted to give these guys a shout out because I really believe in the product. I think you should all head over to optimize.me and at very least take advantage of the free membership. And otherwise, um, definitely, definitely, definitely check out the coaching. For $300, you'll do it for a week and get way more than the amount that you invested in it back in as far as value. Enjoy the podcast. Love to hear how you kind of got into this whole idea of of you know protein centric call it dieting right so I guess we could we could kind of reverse it and say maybe tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and and um, a little bit about your theory or about what you advocate and then how we how you began with that. Sure. Yeah. Well. Um. So I'm a primary care doctor, family practice here in the Seattle area, and I got out of residency about 20 years ago. And my whole career, I've just been really focused on 
diet and exercise and how it affects health. And basically, you know, what are the drivers of chronic disease and what are the drivers of awesome health? And um, pretty much my whole career, I've seen people show up who are either in just horrible, horrible health with like every chronic problem you could think of. And then other people who are just completely, you know, ripped and jacked and amazing. And, um, you know, my whole career, I've been trying to figure out, well, what's, what are the drivers of these two different uh, phenotypes of people who show up, you know, the chronically ill, everything's wrong, degenerative disease people versus the, you know, <clears throat> carved from granite, solid, you know, crossfitters who are like in amazing shape. And it really just does come down to diet and exercise pretty much exclusively. And then I've just been researching for 20 years exactly what levers you can pull when it comes to diet and exercise to get the best outcomes and uh, the most efficient uh, ways to uh, pull some levers, make some changes with diet and exercise and have positive outcomes. And so I've really just been looking at diet and exercise and their effect on health for a couple decades and researching it. And that's how I got to where I'm at. That sounds a little counterculture to your typical family physician. Mm -hmm. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. So I'm guessing you didn't learn any of that stuff in school. It's just kind of a personal passion. Right, right, right. Yeah. This is basically none of this did I learn in medical school or residency. It's just, uh, you know, educating myself just going to the primary research mostly yeah so walk me through how, how you kind of discovered it so you know obviously there's a you know in the fitness industry slash health industry there's a lot of information there's a lot of noise there's a lot of things that people are saying are the most important factors and i think when you know and you'll you'll agree i'm sure is when you get to the top of the totem pole you know when, when i say top of the totem pole the people who actually are, are doing it you see a lot of commonalities and so i'm curious what kind of led you down that path of discovery Right, right. So, you know, I started out just not knowing anything about <clears throat> diet and exercise. And, you know, in, in medical school, they don't teach you crap about this stuff, basically. And, uh, you know, I was raised kind of vegetarian, like that's supposed to be the best diet. And um, that, you know, that obviously didn't lead to instant perfect health being vegetarian. So I knew that was kind of like not the answer, right? Um, I started out uh, from a low carb direction. I had some patients introduce me to low carb dieting and realized, hey, this is pretty powerful. When people just reduce their uh, refined carbohydrate intake, they immediately um, eat less calories and lose fat and they're healthier. And every single thing you can measure, it's better. Their insulin sensitivity goes up and all their numbers improve and everything's you know, just automatically better. Uh, so I was a huge low carb fan for a while. And then I'm like, oh, wow, maybe this paleo thing is, uh, you know, where it's at, because I realized that, oh, when you eat less processed foods, and you eat more protein and fiber, you have higher, you know, satiety, and you don't eat as much. And so I kind of fell through the, the low carb, paleo, keto, carnivore, you know, wormhole that so many people have fallen through. But, but then I kind of realized, oh, wait a second, uh, the low fat people have just as many success stories and anyone who just intentionally lowers the fat um, percentage of their diet is going to immediately have a higher protein percentage, higher satiety per calorie. They're going to have weight loss. Also, in fact, when you equate these uh, low carb and low fat groups, you get the same outcomes. And then I realized, uh, yeah, that's only when protein percent is matched. And then I started going down this rabbit hole of protein percentage. And uh, then I became familiar with the, the research of Drs. Raubenheimer and Simpson, these famous uh, guys in Australia who discovered the protein leverage phenomenon. And uh, basically, there's this protein leverage phenomenon where humans and, and many animals basically eat until they get enough protein, and only then do they stop eating. And that's why protein percentage is one of the biggest drivers of ad lib energy intake out there. And that's why every single study in the medical literature looking at ad lib diets, like people eating as much as they want, uh, fixing protein percentage is the most important variable just right off the top. If you're comparing carbs and fats, you have to fix protein. Well, why is that? Uh, it's because protein percent blows everything else out of the water. It completely destroys any difference between carbs and fats. And then I really started looking at, you know, what do different protein percentages uh, uh, produce in terms of phenotype when it comes to humans or any animals? And so we have all these studies where literally the higher the protein percentage uh, an animal eats, the fewer calories they eat. It's almost perfectly linear up to about 50% of calories from protein in humans. You have this 
completely linear um, ad lib caloric intake, where the higher your protein percentage, the less calories you're going to eat when you, even when you can eat as much as you want. And it, it turns out that there's this huge spectrum of protein percentages where if you're designing an obesogenic rat chow, you're trying to fatten rodents or mice or lab animals as much as possible, you want protein all the way down at 10% of calories and then kind of equal proportions, carbs and fats. And then if you want the very, very thinnest lab rat or mouse, you crank their protein percentage all the way up to about 50%. And they just eat fewer and fewer and fewer calories, even when they have unlimited access to food. And then you kind of look around at the real world and you realize, <clears throat> you know, a hunter-gatherer world, a world macronutrient average for hunter-gatherers is about 33% of calories from protein. Uh, but the standard American diet is all the way down at about 12.5% protein. And then this obesogenic rat chow is at 10% protein. And if you look at things like uh, the uh, databases of people who've successfully lost weight and kept it off, the one thing they have in common is they've managed to get protein to about 20% of calories. And if you look at studies where um, you take pre-diabetics and, and force them to eat 30% of calories from protein, you completely cure 100% of all pre-diabetes. Uh, and then you look at elite bodybuilders who are usually you know, living at 35% protein or maybe even 40% protein uh, from cal uh, of calories. And, and it basically, it turns out that just protein percent of calories is probably the single biggest factor when it comes to how many calories you're going to eat. And <clears throat> that's why, you know, if low carb is an instant win because you're going to have a higher protein percentage. Low fat is an instant win, higher protein percentage. As, as long as you do these right, if you, right. If you somehow do it wrong, uh, I mean, you can do low carb wrong by just eating tons of fat and the protein percentage doesn't go up. And you and, and so why is that wrong? So there's a bunch of other questions in there, Barry, in there that I want to ask you, but why is that wrong? Because you have this whole ketogenic community saying like, you know, you need to have less than 10% uh, protein. So, and the rest is fat. So why is that wrong in your view? Right, right, right. Well, uh, uh, it's because I have so many patients who have stalled out on ketogenic diets. Mm -hmm. And if, if keto was really the answer to just being thin and healthy, everybody would be thin and healthy, right? The whole keto community would be, like amazing sure. everyone would be blown away that just really doesn't happen like every single person who goes on keto loses 20 pounds instantly loves it and boom stalls out hard and just stays there forever that's everybody on keto the whole low carb world lost 20 pounds instantly loved it and then stalled out hard um, and the reason for that is because basically you increase your protein percentage in your society per calorie when you eliminate refined carbs but then if you're eating, if the protein percentage is too low or not improved from there, you're basically, you're going to still overeat calories from fat, your macadamia nuts and your cheese and your butter. And um, you're going to, you're going to get thinner and then plateau out when your protein percent doesn't change. And, and so the, the way you get past that is to crank up the protein percentage, eat leaner proteins, uh, get rid of uh, really high fat foods and refined fats like, you know, butter and heavy cream and oil and high fat dairy and all this stuff. And then you can actually bust through this sort of keto plateau, but you can do the same thing on a low fat diet. And if you're really smart, you're doing both like, uh, you know, like someone like yourself, like a bodybuilder is basically just as low carb and low fat as you can get at the same time. And that's really where I'm coming at it from. Yeah, it's interesting. So there's definitely times, uh, you know, the way I, I still advocate nutrition is you eat as many carbs as you need to fuel performance. And obviously protein is going to be the majority of the diet. So I want to kind of reverse back to something you said, right when you kind of started off talking there was you said you, ra you were raised vegetarian. And then you went on to say that was obviously not the right way to do it. So talk to me about that because it's, that's not so obvious to a lot of people. I still get a lot of people who have a belief that veganism or vegetarianism is in fact a really healthy approach. All right. Yeah. So I was raised vegetarian and, uh, Unfortunately, there were a lot of like fake foods that, you know, were basically a low protein percent and highly processed and highly refined and um, low nutrient density. And so uh, if you do vegetarian wrong, you know, uh, you're basically going to go nowhere. And that's what I was doing. So 
Um, the the type of vegetarian that I was raised is sort of a religious vegetarian where it's just a sin to kill animals, eat them. And so if you just basically eliminate um, high quality animal foods, your the protein percentage of your diet actually goes significantly down because all of your plant foods on average have a lower protein percent than all of your animal foods on average. So it's actually like a slight downgrade to just decide I'm going to religiously avoid animal products. So if you were to make an argument for vegetarianism, because I'm, I'm very curious to hear smart people's opinion, especially if we've done it. So because there is still this, this you know, segment of the, of the population of the world that believes vegetarianism and veganism is the healthy way to do it. What would you say to that? Well, okay, th there is some magic there and that's uh, when it comes to energy density. So there are two huge drivers of ad lib caloric intake. The first one is protein percentage. That's the biggest one. That's the most important one. That's probably the biggest lever anyone can pull. The second one is energy density of the diet. And basically, the lower the energy density of your diet, the less calories you're going to automatically eat, the less ad lib calories you're going to eat. So um, what happens when you go on like a whole foods plant-based diet is your, uh, the energy density of your diet just immediately goes way down. I mean, like you look at the, uh, the Kevin Hall study um, last year where he put people on like a high fat keto group and then a low fat plant-based group. The keto group was animal and the, uh, the low fat group was plant-based and the, the low fat plant-based group ate 700 calories a day less automatically with unlimited access to food. But it turns out they had half the energy density of the overall diet compared to the higher fat, lower carb, keto, animal-based side. So um, if you're just going on a whole plant food diet, you're cutting your energy density maybe in half, which is a huge driver. Now, <clears throat> you can actually have the best of both worlds where you're eating high quality animal proteins but you're getting the leanest ones you can and ones that have a super low energy density as well, like egg whites, you know, amazingly low energy density. The egg whites are ridiculously awesome because it has, you know, it's 100% protein and a super low energy density. You can just eat pounds of this stuff for almost no calories. Right. So if you're really smart, you're marrying those two together. But I would say that anyone who goes plant-based, instant win to a certain degree because you're cutting energy density in half. Yeah, so I always joke that I'm 50% carnivore and 50% vegan. So it's, it's the idea is like really energy dense foods. So you said, I just want you to discern something for the audience. You said that you went from uh, low carb to paleo. Can you differentiate those two things? Yeah, absolutely. So like, you know, my introduction to all this was, you know, basically like Atkins uh, way back in the day. <clears throat> and I had patients who just said, oh, hey, I just stopped eating carbs and boom, I lost 30 pounds and uh, instantly cure my diabetes and my blood pressure has gone. I threw all my meds in the trash and uh, this just blew me away. And I, I saw this over and over people who just, that if you just tell people don't eat carbs, there's so much junk that they're cutting out that it's kind of like this instant win, but it's a win to a point. And then, like I said, if you're replacing these carbs with high energy density, high fat, low protein percent stuff, uh, you're going to stall out really hard and go nowhere. And that's what happens to so many people on a low carb diet. But So then for me, like paleo came along and it was a little bit more nuanced. It was like, okay, you can eat some carbs, just don't eat these processed refined carbs in this certain category. And what it turns out is that this category is foods that are super low in protein percent and super low in minerals and energy density, uh, as, I mean, in nutrient density. So you're basically eliminating a lot of high energy density foods and replacing them with higher nutrient density, lower energy density foods. And so paleo was like one rung on the ladder better than just low carb. And so back then when I didn't really know what the drivers were and I didn't understand any better, I would just kind of religiously follow these one after another. I was like, oh, low carb's awesome. I don't know how or why. I just know low carb's awesome. Look at all these success stories. And then I'm like, oh, paleo's awesome. Look at all these people who lost weight. And so it, it, I had to fall through all of these and research them all. And then finally, I could zoom out and see the whole big picture and what all the drivers are. And the reason every diet has a certain amount of success is because they're 
pulling the same levers, higher nutrient density, lower energy density, higher protein percentage. These are all like kind of different sides of the same coin. So anything you can do to <clears throat> increase protein percent, increase nutrient density, lower energy density, basically lower refined carbs, lower refined fats, uh, processed carbs and fats, uh, you're going to win. Like, and so all these, these diet religions are doing the same thing, a little bit of different parts of all of these things. And once you kind of get the big picture, you can kind of zoom out and pick and choose and you don't have to be religious and you get to be agnostic with your diet, which is kind of my goal, basically. Yeah. One of the things you, you mentioned a few minutes back is uh, appetite control and proteins influence on appetite control and satiety. And I'd love to have you talk about that a little bit. And, you know, is there, I mean, I think subjectively, we all know that that's pretty, um, pretty common. Is there, is there data on that? What are your thoughts on uh, what levels actually cause a decrease in satiety? Sure, absolutely. And so for me, the very most important concept of all is satiety per calorie, right? If I can give you this tiny food, just this one you know, cubic inch of food that gives you a whole day's worth of satiety for like 50 calories. Um, you're done. You're set. Uh, you're just going to lose all the fat you want and just be as thin as you want to be. So it really comes down to satiety per calorie, which is the most magical and important concept of all. And it's definitely evidence-based as to what improves satiety per calorie. There's about nine things that are proven in the medical literature, scientific fact, to improve satiety per calorie. First one is increasing protein percentage, instantly improves satiety per calorie. Second one is fiber, grams of fiber per thousand calories. You increase fiber, uh, you will improve satiety per calorie. The third one is a reduction in refined and high glycemic carbohydrates. So this is an evidence-based phenomenon. Uh, you know, if people eat just like juice and toast and cereal for breakfast, they're literally going to eat 300 more calories during the day. If you reduce refined and high glycemic carbs, you will eat fewer calories. Uh, the, the, the next one is actually eating less fat. So unfortunately, the more fat you eat, the fatter you're going to be. It's passive overconsumption. And, and it's a scientific evidence-based fact that a reduction in fat will actually lead to eating fewer calories. In fact, you can take any animal and just pour fat on top of their usual food and they'll just immediately passively overconsume and get fatter. And so uh, the, the evidence-based things are basically higher protein percent, higher fiber grams per thousand calories, lower glycemic high index carbs, lower fat in general, um, increased water. So, so like, lower fat for satiety or lower fat for fat loss? Lower fat for satiety per calorie. Got it. And this is really, really important because all the keto people are like, well, that's stupid. I, I When I eat butter and bacon, I get tons of satiety. Like I eat a stick of butter. I'm not hungry for 50 years. Fat's the best for satiety. Uh, and what they're not doing is dividing that by calories and coming up with satiety per calorie. So like, yes, but eating a stick of butter gives you crap ton of satiety. Or you won't be hungry forever. Um, but that's a trillion calories. So satiety per calorie is actually garbage and you'd be better off just eating, you know, something way, way, way lower in fat. Um, some sort of lean protein, you know, for would be the best. But yeah, these things are all evidence-based. Higher protein percent, higher fiber, lower carb, glycemic carb, lower fat, um, lower energy density, lower processing, um, you know, less processed foods. The thermic effect is higher. You have to process it yourself burns more calories, you get, you extract more, less calories from it. Uh, we have studies where you just feed peanuts to rats versus peanut butter and they get fatter on the peanut butter. So uh, protein, fiber, water, higher energy density, carbs, fats, processing, alcohol. You want all those lower um, nutrient density, minerals and micronutrients. The higher those are, the higher study calorie. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's de these definite themes that are all evidence-based that all improve satiety per calorie and all make people more successful with a diet. And uh, the idea is you do a little bit of all of these all at the same time. And you can't go too extreme with any of them. You can't eat 100% protein forever and you can't eat 0% fat and you can't never eat any carbs. So you try to just take your existing diet and tweak all these levers up a little bit sustainably, a little higher protein percent, a little higher fiber little higher water, less processed, less carbs, less fat, less energy density, less alcohol, um, more micronutrients. And you just tweak all of these as much as you can stand where it's sustainable. 
And that's uh, that's honestly this whole PE diet concept that I'm talking about. So it's talking about the overconsumption of protein. What's the upper limit? Well, <laughs> so we have studies on you know people eating uh, up to three grams per pound, and they're basically fine. Uh, doesn't seem to do anything bad to you. Uh, it's self limiting. Like no one can eat too much protein. Like you can just give anyone you know ten pounds of skinless chicken breast and tell them to eat too much protein, go for it. You physically can't do it. So e eating too much protein isn't really a thing. That's not like a medical condition. That's not a diagnosable problem. No negative uh, effects on kidneys, <clears throat> uric acid, toxicity, di digestion, putr putrefaction in the stomach, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we, to be fair, we don't have any studies in humans or animals where they're fed 100% of calories from protein forever. Um, apparently this doesn't pass the IRB for research. Like it's, uh, you'll probably die. Like basically we don't know exactly what happens when organisms are fed hundred percent protein, but you're pretty much going to die because you have to eat some essential fats and you can't extract enough energy from pure protein, um, to be able to stay alive. So that's what rabbit starvation is. These explorers who in the middle of winter only had, super lean starving deer and rabbits to eat and their their dietary protein percent was you know 90 plus percent they get very very thin and very nauseated and very sick and you'll probably die if you try to eat 100 protein but nobody knows for sure um so yeah theoretically there is too much protein but in, uh, for any free living human who has access to non-protein energy macronutrients like carbs or fats you will basically eventually just eat less protein and eat more carbon fats automatically, which is what any animal will do. Um, so you can't make yourself eat too much protein. Okay, that's good to know. So is there is there a, con a consideration there for people who have impaired digestion or gut health or microbiome deficiencies? Because obviously that's a big contributor, right? So consuming a certain amount of protein at a meal, if it's over what your body's able to digest and assimilate, again, potentially could cause some, and not necessarily like long-term health effects, but some digestive distress. Oh yeah, absolutely. And so in fact, you, uh, your body will upregulate or downregulate the production of some of these enzymes and uh, factors that digest different foods. So you really never want to take your whole diet and just completely reverse it and flip it on its head and change it hundred percent because you're probably going to struggle to digest X or Y and you want to make more gradual changes. So you can take someone who, um, doesn't have a lot of digestive enzymes for protein, for example, and just progressively overload them and give them higher and higher amounts. And they will eventually adapt or die type thing. You know, you will adapt to, to fit the diet that you're given. That's what you're, you're, you know, humans are this amazing survival machine and we basically can live on any food, anywhere, anytime. Um, but you're going to be uh, in a lot of a world of hurt if you just instantly change something super huge. So you want to kind of progress it very slowly and gradually, just like, you know, bench pressing, you wouldn't just give somebody 500 pounds when they're new, you'd give, you know, you start with the bar, micro loads and plates, the diet's the same thing. You want to just tweak your protein percent up a little, uh, carbs and fats down a little. Um, I wouldn't suggest just radical changes right off the bat. Um, for most people, because like you said, it, it takes a while for your um, GI tract to adjust to these sorts of things. Yeah, I know this may not be your area of expertise, but what's your opinion on protein for kids? Like, is there an upper limit for young people? Well, so uh, kids are seem to be fairly similar to adults. They actually, uh, uh, one gram per pound seems to work, like, honestly, all the way from infancy on up. And there doesn't seem to be a downside to higher protein percentages. So it's not like, okay, adults should really try to tweak their protein percent up um, to, to uh, have higher satiety per calorie and be thinner, but don't do that to kids because it's dangerous. No, that's not really a thing. So there's, there's no particular limitation. Um, I mean, obviously the accepted macronutrient range for humans in general is 10 to 35%. And these are kind of pulled out of thin air and arbitrary, but you wouldn't want to go way beyond those for any human, including kids. Yeah. Can you just differentiate for myself and for the audience, um, like plant-based proteins versus animal-based proteins? I know you talked about it a little bit, but I really want to discern because I, I think 
I always like to ask as per experts in nutrition, um, you know, pros and cons. Right, right, right. Well, so to be fair, anytime you eat a protein containing food, all the proteins are just broken down into the exact same amino acids. So you're going to get the same amino acids from plant foods or animal foods. Uh, the difference is in the percentage of those amino acids, right? So when you eat an animal, you've got the right spectrum of aminos to build an animal. And when you eat a plant, you've got the right spectrum of aminos to build a plant. And so like, for example, you know, animal muscular hypertrophy in humans, leucine seems to be a huge driver of that. And when you eat animal protein, it's about 10 10% leucine on average, uh, but your plant protein is like 6% leucine on average. So, okay, instantly you realize, hey, if I want the same, you know, hypertrophy, I'm going to have to eat, you know, more plant protein to get the same anabolic hypertrophy response as animal protein. So, basically, animal protein is a little better at building animals. You can get there with plant protein, but you might have to eat up to 1.5 times as much. Then there's also a fiber issue. A lot of plant proteins are bound up in fiber and it's harder to extract them. So if you're really trying to scavenge all your protein from like broccoli, you're in a lot of trouble. Like, you know, you'd have to eat enough broccoli to just die of a bowel blockage before you're going to get the same amount of protein that you just, you know, get from a half chicken breast. So um, there are all these benefits to animal protein. It's way more digestible. It's way more accessible. It's got a higher leucine percentage and a better spectrum of aminos to build animals. Um, but you can make uh, plant protein work. And there are plenty of uh, vegan bodybuilders who are doing it. But to be fair, they have to supplement a lot. And they are usually um, aiming a little higher on absolute grams of protein. Very cool. Have you looked at... Um high level uh, consumption in bodybuilders and ultimately like, you know, what the highest level is that you've seen people go that still ultimately maintain health. Yeah. I mean, like uh, Jose Antonio has a study of bodybuilders who, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I think they're eating, oh gosh, I where they up to four grams per kilo. So, yeah. or no, 4.4 grams per kilo. I think the, the longest studies we have are at about um, a year at two grams per pound. And one of Jose Antonio's study, um, and that was pretty uh, pretty um, long time to consume that much protein. And mm -hmm. uh, these why, were body why, why, why is that long? What, like, what's what are they seeing? I'm curious. Oh, right. Well, so like, uh, I mean, I think your average person is just not going to comply with a study like that. Um, but they basically picked bodybuilders who are already eating a crap ton of protein yeah. from whey shakes. And so these people are like, sure, you give me free whey shakes and I'll just keep pounding these suckers. And so that, that's how they got people to eat protein right. that high for a year. It's but they way, saw, I'll go ahead. It was way the same as meat though. So like when we're talking protein, you're just talking, it doesn't matter where it comes from. You're just hitting your numbers. So there's no consideration around like, don't consume over this much animal meat or don't get like, it doesn't matter where it comes from. We're just talking numbers, pure numbers. Well, I, yeah, I'm talking in pure numbers of protein grams. The, the, the difference between whey is when you consume your, you know, bodybuilding whey that's very low carb and very low fat, it's just pure protein, right? Like, so your 30 gram scoop of whey powder is like 27 grams of protein with maybe one gram of fat and one gram of carbs versus like when you eat a steak, it's a hundred grams of steak is only 25 grams of protein. So you're having to eat some extra fat and um, volume and- Yeah, and how about the insulogenic nature of whey protein? I'm curious if that is impacting anything at all. Right, so protein is extremely insulinogenic. Insulin goes way up from egg whites and fish and whey powder, um, but glucagon goes up as well. So your blood sugar doesn't change at all. That's the difference between like, if you eat a donut, hugely insulinogenic, and glucagon goes down and your blood sugar goes way up. Um, that doesn't happen with protein. So when you eat protein, insulin, glucagon go up together and your blood sugar stays flat as a pancake. So you can eat like five pounds of turkey at Thanksgiving dinner and your glucometer will just be flat as a pancake. So you actually don't care that your insulin went up because your glucagon went up as well and the ratio doesn't really change. So like saying, oh, you shouldn't eat foods that are insulinogenic is like... Not, I mean, that's basically a giant load of crap. That's a really bad <laughs> mechanism to be looking at. Okay. Can you talk to us about gluconeogenesis? I know that's something we're throwing around a lot where it's like, if you overconsume protein, your body's going to turn into carbohydrate. And again, I don't think that's an issue. I just want to hear like kind of your thoughts. If you have any, any considerations around that. 
Sure, absolutely. So um, basically, gluconeogenesis is demand driven, not supply driven. So you can eat, you know, a trillion grams of protein, but you'll still only manufacture as much glucose as you need to keep your muscle glycogen topped off and to be, stay alive. You know, I mean, humans maybe make 70 grams of glucose or something a day. Um, <clears throat> the I kind of like eating fewer carbs and more protein and performing a little bit of gluconeogenesis because it's almost like metabolic exercise for your body, right? It's uh, kind of like a uh, your your body has to work a little harder just to stay alive. And so I kind of like that from a David Goggin kind of point of view, right? Like make your liver work a little harder and make your own glucose. But I also, uh, uh, I don't recommend people eat these zero carbohydrate diets because, you know, let's say you need 70 grams of glucose just to keep your brain and your red cells alive and all these cell types in your body that don't have mitochondria and that have to burn glucose for fuel. Um, if you're eating no carbs at all, you're going to basically have to break down, you know, 70 grams of protein just to make enough glucose to stay alive. And so you're, it's kind it's, you're not, it's a little bit protein wasting. Like, like, to be honest, for the average person, just eating a hundred grams of carbs a day is going to be somewhat protein sparing because these, this will spare that much protein that you don't have to use for gluconeogenesis. And so really a carbohydrate intake is on this U-shaped curve where, you know, too high is like the 60% of calories that everybody eats in America, which is a nightmare. But then too low is like these zero carb, keto, carnivore, hardcore things where you're basically not sparing protein, the protein you use to make glucose out of. And it's a little bit smarter to eat maybe, you know, 100 grams of carbs a day or more, uh, another gram for every minute of high intensity exercise you do, which is glycolytic and brain glucose. So you're basically replacing at least the glucose you're burning with high intensity exercise and the glucose you need to stay alive and sparing that much protein. So yeah, gluconeogenesis is definitely something to think about. What's your thoughts on these studies that come out and they say, hey, you can only absorb and digest 30 grams of protein. And then I think they've bumped it up a little bit. But there's always these these researchers saying, hey, you can only uh, absorb, digest, and assimilate this small amount of protein. Yeah, I mean, that's basically not true. So there are plenty of people eating one meal a day, and they're completely fine. Um, you know, if that were if if that was true, humans would have become extinct a long time ago. And we have all these animals, you know, like a lion who eats a gazelle, you know, once a week and a, a cat that eats a mouse every other day and, a, you know, a boa constrictor that eats a rabbit once a month. And like, obviously, animals can eat protein in these boluses. And then you get this, um, you get all sorts of pooling of the amino acids. There's this blanknic bed that pull in your GI tract that pulls some aminos and you have this increased amount of aminos in your bloodstream for, you know, up to 24 hours afterwards. And so there are all these reasons why you can eat protein uh, higher amounts less frequently, and it's very slow to digest. That's the other thing. There's this ileal break in your small intestine where the more the huger piece of protein you eat, the more it slows down your GI tract and kind of meters out the aminos. So honestly, like, I really don't worry about people who are just eating, you know, maybe twice a day. Personally, I think shrinking it all the way down to once a day, it's a little hard to get enough protein in. And so meal frequency is on a U-shaped curve as well. And I think once a day or less is probably really far from optimal, but like nobody eats, needs to eat like 12 times a day. And so, you know, I, I like two, two meals in a snack a day or somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there, it's kind of mythical that there's a limit to how much you can absorb per meal. So I said, I, pre I presume as a doctor, you're looking at a lot of people's blood work on a consistent basis. I'm curious what you're seeing, if anything, as far as maybe unusual blood work that comes back as a result of people consuming a ton of animal protein or a ton of protein in general. So like anything that, that goes up specifically? Yeah, absolutely. Blood urea nitrogen, BUN. So anytime you get a basic metabolic panel or a comprehensive metabolic panel from your doctor, um, <clears throat> part of the kidney function is blood urea nitrogen. This is just a, basically um, an ammonia, like a protein breakdown factor that's in your blood that you're filtering out in your kidneys. And they establish the normal range of blood urea nitrogen, not by looking at what where humans should be, but just from everyone who goes to the lab. So if you take every trillion people who go to the lab, 
and graph out all their BUNs on this little bell-shaped curve, you just put the upper and lower limits of normal at two standard deviations away from the mean on the high end and low end. Right. And that's like 97% of people. And so like everybody on these super high protein diets are going to be way up here on the high end of blood graded nitrogen. And it's going to be reported as high. And your doctor is going to be like, I don't know what's wrong. Maybe something's wrong with your kidneys. As long as your creatinine is fine and your glomerular filtration rate is fine, uh, it kind of doesn't matter how high your BUN is. And we definitely see these higher and higher on people on higher, on higher and higher protein diets. It does seem to be harmless. Do you support digestion with enzymes or uh, HCL or anything like that? Uh, basically, no. Uh, I really don't. But I am aware of the fact that some people, when they really up their protein, struggle with with abdominal pain and digestion and all this stuff. And that's why I am a fan of slowly progressing things. And I find that most people, if they progress slowly, they usually don't have to go that route. I mean, there's always exceptions. I have patients, you know, with chronic pancreatitis and they're taking all sorts of pancreatic enzymes. They kind of have to do that. And I have, you know, different edge cases of people who do need something like that. But the average person, if they're just slowly progressing, they can uh, kind of adapt and get used to it and upregulate their production of certain digestive enzymes. Very cool. What do you suggest as far as as we age, you know, there's this recommendation that we actually need more protein. Um, so do you have like an age dependent recommendation on, on percentages or just like in general, let's try to all get about 35%? Yeah, I don't really, it's not age specific for me. I pretty much recommend everybody target a gram per pound of ideal body weight. Um, and I really think that as you get older, it's more and more important to target that and it's a bigger deal and we do see anabolic resistance. Um, and what, is, so, what does that mean? What, what does anabolic resistance mean? I was gonna ask you, so as we age, what is the reason why we need more protein? Is it digestion is limited or is that the cellular function is decreased? What is that? What is the anabolic resistance? It appears to be that the amount of protein available to trigger uh, uh, hypertrophy and anabolism uh, seems to be higher. So like you need a higher threshold. So you you literally have to eat more protein to get to the same threshold for anabolism. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't seem to be digestive. It seems to be more just triggering the muscle hypertrophy phenomenon. And uh, so I usually don't tell people to, there, there's not an equation with your age in it for me. It's just a mindfulness that as you get higher, uh, older and higher in age, you need, you want to work harder to make sure protein is the first thing you're eating. That's amazing. Um, what are you working on now? What are you excited about? Are you still uh, just advocating your book or do you have something else in, in the, the docket waiting to come out? Yeah, well, I'm working on uh, I'm writing another book on satiety per calorie and talking about the things that we know are um, important for satiety per calorie. And uh, I'm also working with Diet Doctor, dietdoctor.com, trying to kind of uh, up their game on the protein messaging there. Um, and they're basically being a little bit less dogmatically low carb and a little bit more um, open minded as to these other scientific drivers of satiety like protein and fiber and lower <clears throat> refined fats and things like that. Amazing, Dr. Naaman. I know you're a very busy man. I really appreciate you making the time to join us today. Can you tell the audience where they should find you and everything they want to learn from you? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Thank Well, thank you for having me. This is awesome. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, my the best thing I've produced is a book called The P.E. Diet, The P.E. Diet. Great and book. you can get it at thepediet.com uh, or tednaman.com, or you can just go to Amazon or anywhere books are sold online. Um, you can follow me on social media at Ted Naiman. I'm on Twitter and Instagram and all that kind of stuff. So great. Thank you so much for your time. And when the next book comes out, we'd love to have you back. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Naiman. That's a wrap, ladies and gents. So what do you think of Dr. Ted Naiman? So personally, I've always been an advocate of higher protein diets. Once I knew that at least research says that there isn't any negative implications of increasing protein. I've always seen significant benefits personally and with all of my clients around the world with just increasing the protein intake. One, it's going to help you retain more muscle. Two, it's going to improve satiety. Three, I find it improves brain function. I think oftentimes if we overconsume carbohydrates, sometimes brain function becomes a little diminished. And now, as I said in the beginning of this podcast, guys, make sure that the quality meat you're eating is high. If you're going to be neurotic about any of the food you eat, 
be neurotic about the meat and be neurotic about the fats because fats carry with them toxins and obviously meat has fat with it. So we want to be a little bit uh, you know, obsessed or I'm a little bit obsessed uh, with the quality of the meat that I put into my body. I don't ever want to consume low quality meats because I know with the low quality meats, it also comes the low quality fats. And then within those fats is going to be pesticides. And sometimes if the, if the meat is eating corn and soy and these feedlot type diets, then the quality of the meat is significantly lower, ends up being pro-inflammatory. And ultimately, meat can be very anti-inflammatory, or at least low in inflammation, uh, if you're not eating these feedlot factory farm type meats. And ultimately, if you guys hear about climate change and with respect to animals, the reason climate change is becoming an issue is nothing to do with the animals themselves. There's nothing to do with uh, consumption of animals. It's actually to do with the way that, well, most importantly, these monoculture crops are being grown. And oftentimes these farms that have mono monocrops are also housing factory farmed animals. So we don't want to support factory farmed animals. If you guys want to improve the quality of meat on the planet, support the farmers who are doing it the right way. They're rotating crops. They're letting the, the animals graze on their natural environments. And that's the way it's supposed to be to ultimately allow the environment to thrive. So guys, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much to Dr. Naiman for imparting us with such incredible wisdom and some great updates on the research with respect to protein. Some basic takeaways for you. Make sure you increase your protein a little bit. Make sure you divide it amongst um, a number of servings. And in my suggestion, I suggest you do add proteolytic enzymes to your uh, protein meals because there's definitively a benefit uh, for both with myself, my clients, my family. Uh, there's definitively a benefit in improving digestion, improving brain fog, um, and ultimately allowing your body to absorb and assimilate what you eat, right? We don't just want to eat a bunch of food. We want to actually digest, absorb, and assimilate into our bodies what we consume. So guys, thank you very much for being here. Optimize.me slash muscle, get hooked up with a free membership. And I promise you, this is thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of value in this website. And, and if you're someone who ultimately wants to maybe become a coach, or maybe you want to learn how to a process to step into the greatest version of yourself, and this is psychologically start to end, understand philosophy and start to understand life optimization, overcome your own challenges, help other people overcome their own challenges. The optimize.me coaching program is absolutely something you're going to want to pick up. Many of my mentorship students took the course and they all raved about it. We did it together. It was truly, truly great. Optimize.me slash muscle. Thanks guys. Appreciate you. Have a great day. If you enjoy the podcast, don't forget to subscribe, leave us a review. Let me know if I talk too much, you can tell me that too. Uh, but I appreciate you guys listening. Thank you very much for being here. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.